I was so depressed and in shock. And I said, I don't think we'll be able to get out of it. I think that's, that's it. I think that's the end of it. To a country born of rebellion and defined by suffering, on the evening of January 12, 2010, came catastrophe. And then surprisingly, Bill called me the day after. He said, Mary, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting dressed. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to guest you. He said, wait for me. I said, yes, I'll wait for you. Bonjour, messieurs, dames. Bonjour, bonjour. It, it was a huge problem early on. But as I said, we have been through hurricanes. We've been to political problems. So we were prepared. We had a contingency plan that uh, we immediately started. The immediate concern was to make sure that 7,000 Geskio patients had enough of their critical antiretroviral medicines. Okay, merci. Now this is one of the pharmacies. Everything is provided for free. Serving people with HIV has been the bedrock mission since Dr. Bill Pop founded Geskio in 1982. He'd returned home from New York with a medical degree and with agreements to do research with collaborators from Weill Cornell, ties to his alma mater that continue today. Geskio is the French acronym for a study Dr. Pop, Dr. Mare Deschamps, and others were doing here of Kaposi sarcoma, the hallmark of a disease that was becoming a sweeping epidemic in Haiti, one that didn't even have a name yet. Geskio would become the first institution to study the human immunodeficiency virus in the developing world. Today, Geskio directly serves 22,000 HIV patients. We have a very sophisticated electronic medical uh, record to track patients. The data management uh, unit provides us on a daily basis of all patients who miss their appointment. Geskio staffers fanned out on foot and through the media as they looked for their patients. Uh, we informed them uh, through cell phones to the radio when the radio started working of all the other distribution spots that we had. I can show you data, uh, except for about 2% of our patients who unfortunately died, uh, we've been able to track every single patient. Tracking down every patient in the chaos that followed the quake was a spectacular achievement by the Geskio team. They set aside their own grieving for four colleagues and scores of relatives who perished. But that would be only the beginning. Dominique Cizet! Overnight, the earthquake transformed Geskio from an AIDS care center to an emergency hospital and refugee camp. 7,000 people showed up at the door, dying, maimed, desperate people. As you know, we are not a critical care unit. And uh, on day one, we receive patients. We're just about the worst cases I have ever seen as a physician. Uh, young babies that need to be uh, that need an amputation. Uh, pregnant women who have all kind of abscesses. Uh, people with broken bones all over the place. I got an email from uh, Bill Pop uh, a few days after the earthquake. Um, I was also in Haiti, but not in, in the same place. And um, he said, uh, for people who have lost everything, we must give everything. And I knew just what he meant, because we're talking not about our patients, they're now our patients who have no homes, no food, they can't find their children. But Geskio has always had to deal with myriad complications that affect the lives of AIDS patients. And it's for those years of groundbreaking work that Dr. Paul Farmer and many peers say this group richly deserves the Gates Prize for Global Health. Their impact has really been global. Um, and uh, a lot of programs that we now see uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, I believe some of them have roots in Haiti, and, and uh, Geskio is very much at the heart of these efforts. Geskio published the earliest scientific papers to help understand HIV in the developing world. It developed treatments to control the diarrhea that AIDS patients can suffer for weeks, also treatments to prevent tuberculosis, which afflicts half of all HIV patients in poor countries. Geskio staff have worked with numerous international colleagues. Dr. Warren Johnson at Weill Cornell was the first, a colleague and mentor of Dr. Pop. Going back 30 years ago, we hired a laboratory technician, then hired a nurse, 
I don't think either one of us had any appreciation for what Geskio has grown to be. Most critically, it was research here that proved that a system of distribution could be developed to provide life-saving antiretroviral drugs to Haitians without fear that their improper use would lead to drug resistance. The dogma then was that poor people, uneducated people, really can't understand that it's important to take their medications. We were able to show quite clearly that your level of education had nothing to do with your ability to comply with taking your medications. Today, more than four million patients in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are on antiretroviral drugs, people who would likely not be alive without them. The dozens of field workers and clinicians at Geskio must deal with both the virus and its social and economic context. Antiretroviral drugs lessen the viral load, not the stigma of HIV. I was not feeling well, and my boss did not understand that. And because of the stigma, I had to stop working, and I'm still not working. What Joseph can count on are regular visits by his Geskio counselor. Mote is always calling me to remind me of my scheduled visit. And also, it's a very good thing to always have someone to visit you, because I don't usually have a lot of visitors. At the other end of the demographic spectrum is 21-year-old peer counselor Gloria. She first came to Geskio as a patient and was diagnosed with HIV when she was 14. She's lived through depression and thoughts of suicide and now shares her life experience to treat the shame her own clients likely endure. They're more comfortable talking to somebody their age because they feel they know that the person understands them. Mm -hmm. I have about 20 clients a day. 20 clients, one day. Behavior is not easy to change if you cannot offer an alternative. Without an economic development, without the job creation, we will not be able to fight the epidemic. The January 12th calamity brought assistance, resources, new opportunity, and resolve to rebuild a nation torn by decades of political upheaval economic decay, and brain drain. So many human resources left. We are out of, of nurses, uh, midwives, engineers, teachers. 40% of the infants who need to go to school cannot go to school. Then the, the earthquake. So many uh, calamity, but all this become challenging. We said probably we will build better, and maybe the population will be closer. And I think this is getting better. In fact, that's true. Marie Marcel Deschamps and John William Pop left Haiti only for graduate education. They returned to share their knowledge through training, research, and of course, the care of patients with HIV. We are the main training center in Haiti for physicians, nurses, lab technicians, community leaders, religious leaders. So uh, last year alone, we've trained over 2,500 people in the different categories. Their impact is plain to see in the numbers. For all the poverty and turmoil that normally send infection rates skyward, Haiti's HIV infection rate has declined by more than two-thirds, from 6.2% in the early 1990s to less than 2%. It's especially sweet because early in the epidemic, this country bore a humiliating burden. Haitian ethnicity was deemed by scientists to be a risk factor for AIDS, one of four H's. Homosexual, heroin addicts, hemophiliacs, and then the fourth one was Haitians. And uh, we prove, documented, that Haitians had the same risk factors as everybody else, while in textbooks of medicine all over the world, they indicated that we were at risk. So obviously, uh, Haitians suffered a lot, and this has united the country against this disease. I wish that we could use it to fight poverty, uh, to fight illiteracy, uh, to fight reforestation, and I think it's a good example to show what we can do. You have to remember our motto is united we are strong.